first of all, I would like to welcome my guests and um, give a little bit of background of each of them so that you have to understand what they represent and then we'll dig deep into the uh, details. So Dr. Todd Hilton, he's the Executive Director of the Contextual Robotic Institute and prof uh, Professor of Practice in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at UCSD. Uh, his research includes uh, computing systems and application to AV and robotic systems. Prior to his appointment at UCSD, he was in, in the industry, so he was a VP at Brain Corporation, it's a local company, I think if you're, some of you might be familiar with it, uh, a San Diego based uh, startup. Um, and from 2007 to 12, he served as a, he was working with DARPA and, um, and other institutions. He has a PhD from Stanford and a BS from MIT. Second, um, uh, in no particular order, is Shyam Sundar, he's sitting on the far side. Uh, he has the product AV, at, uh, head of, uh, global head of product AV at Faraday Future. Um, he uh, started from uh, smart devices and mobility and at Qualcomm, and then he, uh, he was uh, moved to uh, autonomous driving at Faraday Future. He has an MBA from UCLA, and, uh, and we would love to hear from him what Faraday Future is planning to do in this uh, autonomous domain. George Hertz, uh, I don't know if many of you know, but George is uh, the CEO of uh, Karma.ai. They just launched an uh, uh, amazing uh, product, um, which I use personally, so I'm a big fan of George. And George uh, is, uh, I don't know many people know that he's the pers uh, first person to jailbreak iOS. Uh, um, and thanks to him, <laughs> uh, we have uh, you know, this uh, capability now. Um, he, um, he will be sharing his perspective of autonomy from his vantage point uh, and uh, what Karma.ai is doing um, and, and, um, and, and you must have heard of their product, uh, Panda, you know. Vivian, uh, Vivian represents uh, Too Simple. Again, a fact that Too Simple is a unicorn in San Diego. Uh, they are above $1 billion valuation, so we have unicorns in San Diego. And uh, she has the business development, and I think thanks to her, she's going to fly in a few hours, but she made it to this event. And uh, she, I, I was told she was employee number nine or ten at uh, Too Simple, so I think she's been there for a while. And Too Simple is uh, is uh, doing. Uh, you just saw an uh, announcement that they did a partnership with UPS, so they are really driving the boundaries on uh, autonomy and trucking. And what we'll touch upon is that there are two different paths: like it's consumer autonomy and. Uh, and you can say commercial autonomy, and uh, and uh, I think it will be good to get their perspective on what will come, when, and how. With that said, I think what I'll do is I will quickly touch upon some of the quick facts, not more than three minutes, and then we'll we'll have each of these panelists present their uh, part of the presentation. So. Self-driving car or uh, autonomous driving, some of the key milestones, I think, uh, if you look at the history, uh, there was um, no hands across America in the July 1995, and not, not many people know that they drove from Pittsburgh to San Diego, almost 98.2% autonomous, in 1995, <coughs> using vision sensors. Uh, you can Google it up, and it's amazing that you know it was so many, so many years ago, like 30 years ago, approximately. Then the next milestone that I consider is Mobileye, an uh, Israeli company that started building ADAS um, in 1999. And think about 1999, we are in 2019. So 20 years ago, when you say self-driving ADAS, it was a very, uh, a very different concept. Uh, so they, they, let, they became the pioneer, they were acquired by Intel for $15 billion. The key turning point, I think, was DARPA Grand Challenge. And what happened was DARPA gave a challenge to, to build this technology. And they have multiple challenges, one in March 2004, one in October. And the first one was won, won by, in 2004, nobody can win it. And the idea was to drive in a desert autonomously. And, uh, the, and in uh, 2005, um, the Stanford team, uh, which is uh, Stanley, uh, it's, they won the, the first one. The next one was uh, even harder, to drive in an urban environment. And they're very different dynamic driving in a rural and urban uh, open environment. And uh, that was won by, um, and that was unique also because there are different sensors. So that was the first time LiDARs were used uh, in the, then Google started jumping into that. They got a bunch of team from that uh, original team, and uh, they started building uh, self-driving in 2009, 10 years ago. And then the, the core technology, which is uh, deep neural networks and uh, the AI behind it, that evolved also in the last 10 years. So with uh, Kitty, AlexNet, and uh, DeepMind, AlphaGo, uh, you know, those are the turning points that this technology is ready for the prime time. Then Tesla also uh, is the one that has, you can say, some sibling of autonomy right now commercially available. And then obviously, uh, NHTSA and DOT, um, Department of Transportation, uh, gave us guidelines. I'll quickly touch upon it because they will talk about level two, level three, so just to know uh, what we're talking about. 
So level zero to level five means that the cars we have to the point that we are check, uh, you can drive by itself in all conditions. And that's a spectrum that we are trying to traverse right now. And we, different people are different. Some say they are three, some say they are 2.5, and that's what we are trying to hear from them. And how far away this uh, nirvana of uh, level five is from all of that. So that will be our uh, conversation. While growing up, I watched uh, this program, and this was still level four, not level five. So we are because <laughs> So I think just want to make sure. Few quick points. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight is that, and this shows the, uh, the, the enormous of this problem that these guys are trying to solve. So first of all, the hardware is very expensive, and that's something that George is trying to address. Right now, if you build a nice fancy car with LiDARs and all, you're talking about 70 to 150K. What George is doing is like, you know, maybe like uh, less than few Ks, you can have uh, some level of economy in the car in which he will uh, dig deep. Second point is how many miles that we need. So it keeps increasing. So 20, right now Google has at 20 million miles that we have driven, actually. So what it means is that the more data you have, the more accurate your modeling would be. And that's a challenge that you, you need to solve. And I think how do you solve it? Again, George will touch upon it that how you're solving it. Um, and then uh, I think the data is again a problem that we're generating a tons of uh, amount of data, like from one terabyte uh, data. These numbers keep changing, but at the end, what we say is that a lot of data is generated uh, from these kind of sensors and that we have. What problem are we trying to solve? So the problem we're trying to solve is that there are 1.3 million people that die in road accidents every year, uh, 30,000 are in, in North America. And we're trying to, uh, one of the, the business case or use cases to make that completely, uh, you know, address that and then um, and alleviate that. And then obviously there are other problems like congestion um, and then the other areas that we need to touch upon. So with that, I think I want to lay the foundation and then I would like to invite uh, George to uh, go over his presentation. And, um, and I think he did a big launch, so I think maybe touch upon that. So let me turn on your slide. This whole space is insanely sad. Uh, there's, don't listen to what is put out by marketing people and by business people. That's all you're hearing from in this space. Please look at it for yourself. How many of you have actually gotten to ride in one of these cars? Probably, if you guys have experienced one, it's Tesla Autopilot. Right? How many have ridden in a Waymo? How many have ridden Tesla Autopilot? So there we go, right? You see what's real and you see what's not real. And this is, it, this is, it, it honestly depresses me so much. Um, you know, why play a game if everybody is playing by a different set of completely rigged rules where, you know, what does Drew Carey say in, in that show? It's like, it's all made up and the points don't matter. I mean, that's what it seems like. Um, so, my name is George Hotz. I'm the president of Kamei. Uh, in 2015, I rigged up an Acura to drive itself. You know, I, I met with D1 and like, uh, they wanted to build a vision system for autopilot that wasn't based on mobile. I'm like, I could do this in a few months, and I did. Um, then you do this, and then you're like, okay, well, this will be easy, right? The Elon is autopilot, this will be easy to, to sell to the car makers, right? Um, no, no, it's, it's not easy, because the car makers, I mean, finally now, we could test the stock. Again, sad. Uh, there's a Paul Graham tweet from five years ago saying, the Model S is the iPhone of cars. Um, the difference between the Model S and the iPhone is when the iPhone came out, all the phone manufacturers were like, oh, oh crap, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta catch up to that. And all the, the car makers laugh at E1. They're like, yeah, no one's gonna buy an electric car. All right, um, look where you are today. Uh, so yeah, we make this thing. Uh, this is our new one, it's called Comet 2. It's $999, you can put it in your compatible Honda, Toyota, Jeep, GM, Chrysler, it supports 63 different cars, and it basically gives your car Tesla autopilot equivalent functionality. Um, you can drive for hours on the highway without touching anything. Actually, in that way, it's even better than autopilot. Uh, we use a forward-facing camera uh, to monitor the driver. Um, it's like how you should do it. GM does this with Super Cruise, too. There's really, there's three good systems on the market today. There's autopilot, there's Super Cruise, um, and there's us. Uh, so, maybe go to the next slide. Um, this is what this thing looks like mounted in a car. Um, it's, our slogan is make driving chill. That's another thing. People are always like, all self-driving cars, our goal is to reduce accidents, our goal is safety. No, safety is a necessity, it's not a goal. Right? Safety doesn't sell products. What, what are you going to do? You get a fear monger? Right? Like, this isn't, 
No. The slogan is make driving chill. Safety is just an added bonus, right? The purpose of cars is not to be safe. The purpose of cars is to get people from point A to point B. Safety is just something you need to do and need to have in your product. So I hate this rhetoric around it, but again, you know, who, who uh, comes off of all of this? Um, so we're uh, completely open source. Um, all the code that runs on here, it's called OpenPilot. It's 100% open source. Um, honestly, you can't give this stuff away. You can't give this stuff away. There are companies now, there are ADAS companies now, trying, oh, okay, get all their business development people, they're trying to pitch to OEMs. And they're trying to pitch something that's worse than what we're literally giving away for free with an MIT license. This thing is really good. It's a thousand bucks. If you have a supported car, go buy one and try it. Like, uh, read or go on YouTube, search for OpenPilot. You'll, you'll find Drives, not put out by us. Again, it's not our marketing material. These are our users. Sitting at the wheel, watching the car drive for hours and hours and hours. Um, uh, so yeah, we have um, the user thing is old. Uh, we have over 1,500 monthly active users, and that's our cumulative miles. Oh, Waymo has 20 million miles. We have 15, right? Like it's, it's not, this nothing. This is, this is nothing when it comes to it. Tesla has billions and billions and billions. Uh, and that's another great myth of this thing, like, oh, 20 million miles, that's so much. It's, it's really nothing. This thing is just getting started. Um, we're growing exponentially. Uh, yeah, and you want to solve level five economy, that's how you do it. The only way to really do it is with big data, with incremental improvements, and with an end-to-end -end solution. When people are trying to break things down into perception and planning, they've already lost. And I think one point I want to highlight is that Commodore AI moved from, they started in Bay Area, and they're now based in San Diego. Okay, thank you, George. I think the next would be um, Vivian. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy Saturday. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Vivian, so I'm head of business development at Christopher. We are a self-driving truck company based in San Diego. We are uh, worldwide have 600 employees based in San Diego. We're testing our truck fleet, which consists of a uh, truck of pa uh, Packard truck, Peterbilt, uh, and Navis our truck in Arizona, Tucson. We also are testing our truck in Shanghai Port, uh, Australia, and many other cities in the world. Uh, we are really excited because trucking has gained a lot of momentum in the past uh, year or so. Back in 2016, when I just first joined the industry, everyone was claiming to have 20, uh, in 2019, self-driving truck, self-driving car without a driver. Uh, but here we are, 2020, we still haven't seen anything other than Wimo 1 uh, trying to do so in Chandler, Arizona. So I think ever since 2019 in CES, Daimler had uh, made an announcement about their endeavor to really put all of their focus on level four trucking versus their uh, passenger car technology. The world has really woken up that uh, trucking is really the first use case for uh, deployment of self-driving technology. Uh, the reason is very simple, you know, the interstate highway system in the United States combined is 50,000 miles. But in the city of uh, Phoenix alone, all the roads and all the street combined together is more than 50,000 miles. So the amount of work you have to map the entire city um, and nationwide versus just interstate highway is very different. And for trucking, it's very repetitive routes, uh, predicted, um, uh, predicted schedule. So everything we can do a lot of planning ahead of time. So I would say I wouldn't say it's, it's an easier task, but it's definitely different. So Too Simple is on the forefront of this technology revolution for trucking deployment. Uh, we are really focused on level four technology, which means we can do, provide a driverless solution. We're working very closely with our OEM, which is uh, truck manufacturers. Uh, to bring the product to the market together. It will be an integrated solution, for example, Fed FedEx or UPS, which is one of our investor and strategic partner, is able to buy 10,000 or thousands of trucks uh, from the factory line directly, all service maintained by the OEM brand, which it has uh, hundreds of years old of recognition and support. So give you an overview, I'm not sure not everyone in the room know a lot of trucking, uh, but it's the backbone of our economy. We have uh, 800 billion industry just from 2019. It is ever growing because of the e-commerce need and a lot of other growth in the economy. So the high operational cost from a driver, which consists of 40% of the total cost, and ever uh, the fleet is uh, surviving uh, very barely because of their margin is very thin. I think the best fleet in the United States probably can have a 10% profit margin, but smaller fleet really they're just surviving. 
There is a big driver shortage in the truck industry right now. As we speak today, we have 50,000 drivers, and the number will go into 200,000 in 2024. Um, the, the cargo will be backed up in Port of LA, you, your uh, Tallahassee, you know, those ports will be backed up because the driver is really in their need. Um, the, we are also trying to um, solve this problem to bring safety to the market. Uh, there is a big problem in the market because 90% of the accidents are caused by human error and every single time with a big accident involving a big rig, that is going to be very fatal. So with this technology, we really think it will be much safer for the road for you and I sharing the, sharing the public highway system to be uh, much safer and much your mind is at ease. We also have then conducted a study with UCSD uh, last year. Uh, it proved out to be the technology can provide 10% of fuel saving. Uh, it is a big deal um, in the trucking industry. 10% uh, is going to change your profit margin very uh, drastically. And it will also uh, increase the truck utilization rate dramatically. The big problem in the trucking market right now is when you have a, what we call a backhaul problem. Let's say you have uh, cargo from going to LA to Phoenix, but you can't find a load going back, then you have really wasted your resources. So with stuff you driving truck, you 24 seven, day and night, rain and shine. So it can be just running on the street uh, very constantly. So we do believe that the regulation is also ahead of the technology. So this is a common myth that people think, okay, uh, the regulation is hindering the process of self-driving truck technology or self-driving car technology. It's actually not true. Uh, we are working very closely with USDOT, FMCSA, uh, and uh, NHTSA to work with the regulation and prove that this is a very um, safe technology that uh, we are able to bring to the market in the short amount of time. So at this moment, we have a patchwork among different states. Let's say California has a very different rule than Arizona. Uh, so we're working with this uh, dynamic every single day. But uh, the good news is USDOT Elaine Chow, um, Secretary Chow has been a big supporter of this technology and she has been working very closely with the innovators like Tucson Bolt to work out a 50 state solution by the end of 2020. Uh, she does, does have a very strong hand in working together with a lot of the agencies. But the goal is to have a very consensus-based solution along uh, 50 states by the end of 2020. And you guys can log on the USDOT website, AB 3.0, uh, AB 4.0 actually, just a, a release here in CS a couple weeks ago in Vegas. Uh, have reiterated the path for full commercialization. So we're very proud to work with USDOT on many of those initiatives, and this really will give to companies like Too Simple a very good path on the commercialization. So yeah, I will, I will uh, close uh, you know, from this slide, but uh, happy to answer any questions uh, during this panel and afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be Shao. Okay, so, uh, good morning. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at our car up there in front of the building, please do. Uh, I guess uh, seeing is believing. Uh, I, I do have a few slides, but you need to see the car. Um, we're Faraday Future. We're based in Gardena, California, which is uh, sort of at the intersection of 405 and 110 in uh, LA. Uh, very interesting neighborhood. Um, and I head technology product management, uh, anything that touches upon software. It's a startup, so if there's a technology problem to solve, that's, uh, they look for me. Uh, given that, uh, what is Faraday Future? So a typical EV startup, um, it's, we build what is known as a skateboard or a platform. We call ourselves a variable platform architecture. Basically, it is a, there's a Lego block of batteries and uh, motors that could really deliver any amount of power uh, for any vehicle class. Um, shrinkable, expandable, um, the way you look at it, and then you basically have a vehicle body on top of it. So that's what any typical um, EV startup does, but we went further. Um, obviously, there's a good amount of uh, you know, luxury and premium elements to it. Uh, that's just part of the whole story. Uh, but what is Faraday? What is our DNA? Our DNA comes from our founder, YT, who has been uh, a pioneer in smart devices. Um, smart TVs, smartphones, and so on. So he started out to really build something called a smart car. Um, and what is a smart car? 
there's a lot of technology that we today take for granted. Remember smartphones in 2005 before the iPhone? Um, you know, you use them to make phone calls and then maybe a few other things. But a smart car is what a smartphone is today. Um, it's really, it brings in technology, connectivity, a lot of computing, AI, autonomy, applications, cloud, and content, really delivering the experience that you depend on your smartphones for today uh, inside a car, because you're gonna be spending a lot of time in your car, and uh, your life really doesn't come to a stop when you're inside the car when you're doing those long commutes. And that was his vision to build this vehicle, and that's what we built. Um, his goal was to build an intelligent and a green consumer device on wheels. Uh, it's not a box that takes you from point A to point B. And then B at Faraday now call it the third internet living space. You have your internet living space at home, another at office, and then the one in between going from home to office. That's your third internet living space. So quick couple of things on autonomy on, at Faraday or what we believe in. So there's really two things to autonomy. I mean, we hear a lot about autonomous driving, which mostly talks about the Waymo's and the Ubers of the world, which are robo-taxi companies, if you think about it. But then there's this whole world of personally owned vehicles that need to be autonomous. So what exactly does that mean? We're delivering safety, comfort, and time savings to our customers. So that should be the focus of a personally owned vehicle. Whereas the robo-taxis, it's really about getting rid of the driver um, for economic reasons. You don't want to pay a driver. So that really changes the economics of the business, and it really allows new business opportunities. So that there's a big dichotomy there. And we're obviously on the left side of this picture. Uh, but is this really a divergent path? Sometime in the future, it's all going to converge. And uh, you will see, obviously, you have the choice of sharing vehicles, or you have the choice of personal vehicles, or you have a choice of very custom uh, mission-specific vehicles. So I think that's where the convergence point is going to be. It's really going to be a mission-specific vehicle, a moving office on wheels, um, a moving uh, you know, living room on wheels, and so on. Real quick to touch on this, um, <coughs> well, these are the levels of autonomy. This is what you get when you go to these levels of autonomy. Um, basically, Faraday is at that point where when you're inside your car, what do you do? What do you do with the time that, we, uh, that you've been given? And that's where our focus zone is. I want to close with this picture. Uh, this picture is very interesting. This is sort of the Faraday neighborhood, the most beautiful freeway in the entire world, 405. Um, and why do we put this picture up there? We commute on the 405 every single day. So the 405 affects everything that we do in terms of the designs and the requirements and so on. Uh, we're always thinking about the 405. So imagine a future where every car on the 405 is autonomous. And that is a beautiful future to look forward to, and that's what we're looking to build. We're like three blocks from the 405, so you know we want to see a beautiful 405 sometime soon, and we want to, I mean, no pun intended, uh, being inside the 405 in a vehicle needs to be a breeze and fun. So that's what Faraday Future is all about. Thank you. I'll start with Dr. Nord first. I think. Um, you, you don't think you've seen the slides? Yeah. Uh, so I think what we'll do is uh, we will uh, start with QA, and then uh, the question is the, of what. Uh, so when I went to CES 2017, 18, wow, level 5 is coming in 2020, and you know, all these nice cars were there, and everything problem had been solved, and now I went to CES, and it doesn't look like it. <laughs> so I just want to get from your perspective, just on facts, no marketing where we are on the consumer side and on the commercial side of the trucking. Because I think the problem statement might be a little different that you can, when you drive in a highway versus uh, city roads. So maybe I'll start with Todd, Dr. Todd, that you know, based on your academic research and the work you're doing at UCSD, uh, what's your perspective on that reality, uh, what you see? And uh, what, what are the roadblocks? Well, I think there's, uh, in the past few years, there's come an understanding that level five autonomy is not immediately within reach. And so people are doing very sensible things like doing automated uh, driving assistance that helps us drive and hopefully makes us safer as well. And they are simultaneously looking at narrower applications and narrower domains, say highways, so that the vehicles don't have to go everywhere and so that they can build infrastructure to support those efforts. I think the goal of level five autonomy is a, it's kind of a dream. I'm not sure uh, that we have the technology or the understanding of how to do it. If it were the case, for example, that 
such vehicles would have to have some sort of artificial general intelligence, as we suppose we do, then we don't know how to do that. So the, the approach should be, and what's, what's happening now, is to narrow the scope so that you can engineer a solution that works in the domain that you, where you, where you target and to target your businesses accordingly. That's these three or something. I think maybe somebody wants to jump in. Uh based on your vantage point, um, and real um, facts, not marketing. Sure. Um, well, basically, the, I mean, the fact is this, right? Um, I commute on the 405 pretty much every day, and uh, you know, what percentage of the cars in the 405 are autonomous? A very, very small percentage. So the real problem on the 405 is not the cars, it's the people, right? So, but at the same time, uh, you have to realize that level five autonomy is right you know, drive anywhere, drive anytime is like, it's definitely far out there. But if every car on the 405 was level two autonomous or level three autonomous, that would be a really much better place. So what I mean to say by that is the growth towards level five autonomy is gonna be very incremental. Uh, you don't have to get there tomorrow and you probably will not get there tomorrow. But the important thing is to keep solving enough problems to progressively get better and better at autonomous and most of the benefits of being autonomous are gonna come in in the first 20 to 30% of being autonomous. Uh, and the remaining 70% uh, of the goals of level five autonomy, they're gonna take a long time. But you know, the whole point is not to try and set a timeline on it, but to really solve enough problems to get there over time. Um, I would say, as our good friend Alex Roy, uh, is he's the uh, podcast, Autonicast, which is a very good uh, uh, podcast in autonomous uh, space, he always say that uh, in the levels of autonomy, only the even number counts. Uh, and I think I would agree with him because uh, level two, I think, really solve the problem of keeping the driver alert not only for passenger car, also for commercial vehicles. Level four you, is the first level you can take the driver out and you still can uh, accomplish a lot of uh, unit economics but by doing so. Level two, level three, and level five probably are not so much having a business value. Level three, as you may know, is uh, supposedly a very fully or very autonomous, but the driver needs to be engaged at full time. It is very difficult for the driver to trust this vehicle and to keep alert, uh, but at the same time. So that really leads to some safety concerns from, uh, from our perspective. And level five is, I think, uh, for the completion of the, um, for, for the levels, right? You are asking this vehicle to drive across the desert, uh, no map whatsoever, uh, you know, anytime, anywhere. So we believe that level four is a good use case for trucking, uh, just given the uh, situation I have mentioned in the trucking space. And uh, level two is good for passenger car probably in the near future to be implemented uh, for, uh, the, uh, for you and I to use. Uh, it's a total myth that the levels are different. Uh, two, three, four, and five are exactly the same. The only difference between them is who's taking liability. In level two, the driver is always liable. In level five, the driver is never liable. This is made by business people. It's not made by engineers. So you can say this is a level two system. Well, what does that mean? It means that on its own, it makes more mistakes than a human would. But it's not a qualitative difference. As we drive mistakes down to zero, eventually one day, well, okay, when does it become level five? When it's 10% safer than a human, 2x safer, 10x safer, right? It's just a question of how many disengagements uh, you have. Um, this whole dichotomy of, look, if you're building a system, if you're building a level two system that detects lanes on the road, you've already lost. What is a lane, right? Oh, you gotta look for little white marks. Now you've lost, right? The way that we train this, it's completely end to end. Uh, we look at where humans drive in the scenario. What is the definition of driving? It's what humans do when they drive. If you're thinking about a limited operational domain, you're never gonna solve level five, but you're not even gonna build a good level two system. So why not solve the whole thing and then make it you know, quantitatively better over time? There's no qualitative difference. Thank you. And so next question is, uh, there seem to be a split in the, uh, in the industry between the sensors to be used so there's a whole LiDAR cam, which is everybody, and there is a visual uh, sensing, which a Tesla is uh, a big proponent of. And it's been going on for a while, and I think that like George mentioned that the only cars that actually are in the road, whether it's level 2, 2.5, whatever you call it, are the Teslas. So the question to all of you would be that, uh, do you feel that vision-only sensing 
um, can be a solution for uh, solving these problems, or LiDAR is a must. I'll be fast. How many of you can drive a car? How many of you have a LiDAR? There's the answer. <laughs> Anybody else have an opinion on that? Well, I would say, uh, pragmatically, we got to get rid of the LiDAR. But we use it in our university vehicles currently because it makes some things a lot simpler. So yeah, I like, I like, I like vision radar systems. Symbol is also a vision-based solution. Uh, our camera actually can see over a thousand meters away, which is uh, um, quite substantial, especially for trucking. You have a longer stopping distance for uh, big rigs. Uh, we do believe a camera-based solution will be much stronger than LiDAR-based solution just because of the range of perception distance. Uh, for a best LiDAR system today, you probably can see uh, around 200 meters. Uh, but for cameras, you can see much further. But I think a uh, combination of sensor really increase redundancy and uh, bring us a very stable system. Yeah, I mean, it's just all about redundancy and kind of giving the impression to people that they are safe, right? I mean, yes, we do have two eyes and uh, we trust our eyes. Sometimes we take, them, take our eyes off the road and we still expect the car to drive itself. Uh, but leaving that aside, I mean, if I gave you a car with just one camera, people de do tend to get a little bit nervous. So it's probably more of a phase where we need to tell you that, oh, there's more than one uh, sensor that's taking care of you. So it's all about no pun intended perception. But uh, over time, yes, I do think uh, vision will, uh, I mean, it's going to improve enough to really make us feel safe in our cars. But it's just more of an interim to say, hey, I've got multiple sensors, redundancy, more inputs to make you feel much safer. Thank you. Um, a quick comment on perception. I want people to be scared using these systems. I don't want people to feel safe because none of them are better than humans. People should be scared and people should be ready to take over at any time. Sounds good. Uh, so one question is about, there's a lot of talk about non line of sight technology, uh, intent days, uh, V2V, V2X. Uh, do you guys feel that if, say, we reach that nirvana of sensing and we can, uh, we can solve the problem, do we still need uh, car to car communication uh, to see non line of sight decision making? Um, or do you feel that, but just by itself, if this technology matures, whether it's 2.5 and becomes 4, uh, that's a good to have, but it's not a must have uh, for uh, making, uh, getting as close to human as possible, uh, or making uh, wrong decisions? Well, it's, uh, I mean, I mean, well, many people, uh, have you heard of TCAS, uh, Collision Avoidance System on Airplanes? When the pilots, I mean, the pilots are very, very good at what they do, right? But there are circumstances where a TCAS really prevents major accidents. So that's what uh, all these non-line of sight technologies are all about. Are adding a, a layer of safety on top of what you already have. Um, if it saves enough lives to make it worth the cost, I think it's definitely worth it. But obviously, like uh, we were discussing, this, all the sensor redundancy and so on, it's just more to make people feel safe. And stay, I mean, save a few lives here and there. But yeah, uh, it, is, it is a very valuable addition. Uh, it's not very essential. So I think we're running uh, very close to the time. So I think if the audience have any questions, uh, you can raise your hand. Hi, thank you. I'm just curious if you think that 5G with its low latency and higher reliability is important or a necessity for level four, level five? And if that's not the major impediment, what are the two or three major impediments to the adoption of level four or five? Thank you. It's all completely AI. Uh, there's no difference at all between 4G and 5G. 5G is mostly driven by hype. It is 5G is still nowhere near reliable enough to have the cloud in the loop for a level four driving system. Our current system design does not uh, take into consideration of 5G, where neither is a requirement, because we believe that uh, every single vehicle has to make a decision on its own, given the time uh, and the process it takes to have a 5G even uh, be implemented nationwide. And uh, our fleet, especially for trucking, we're going to a lot of mountainous rural areas, we lose signal all the time, we lose GPS all the time, so we have to take into consideration of those scenarios, and the vehicle has to be able to run in every case every uh, situation. Yeah, I think the answer I gave for B2X is kind of uh, applicable here as well. 5G is one more tool in the, in the entire arsenal. Um, at Faraday, we look at this as an opportunity where we are saying, okay, you're not gonna be driving, you're gonna be spending a lot of time in the car, you need to be connected, you'll be doing a lot of things, your life needs to continue. From that perspective, yes, connectivity is great. 
uh, and also collecting data and the car definitely, you know, there's a swarm of, I mean, swarm, swarm intelligence is really all cars keeping each other informed and, uh, and providing status, so there's, the connectivity is great, the faster, the better, uh, but somebody is definitely paying the bill, so we've got to optimize the data usage as well. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great tool, but it's, again, not a necessity. So my, my comment, well, I largely agree with these comments, but I, I would offer that I think in certain environments, let's say a campus like UCSD, um, connectivity to the vehicles may be both practical and meaningful, um, and so where the constraints are different than they are, say, in the example. Then, uh, last question. Uh, anybody else? So I, Sean, I, uh, this is Sanjeev uh, Nanda. I think you're leaving the impression that uh, uh, all these redundant sensors and uh, the cameras and multiple is only about a perception of safety rather than actually required for uh, safety. And I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I mean, yeah, no, sorry, I didn't mean to leave that impression. Uh, what we are saying, what I'm saying is that, yes, the technology will get better and better over time. Definitely, it's, it's software, it's, uh, it's science. We can solve the vision problems. We can make it very, very safe. Today, um, you know, we, we we hear many, many potential customers asking this question. Okay, hey, you know what? I I, I mean, I don't feel very safe in a Tesla. Uh, I mean, this is we're bad in quoting someone. Um, do you have a lidar? So that question comes up very often, right? We do, do you have a radar? How many radars do you have? It's today people's uh, people definitely feel safer when you have multiple redundant sensors. So we do have to address that as well because we are at the end of the day selling a vehicle or leasing a vehicle to an end customer. People with one eye can drive cars very safely. Uh, when they do crash, it's largely because they're drunk, distracted, or asleep, not because their eye failed. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I think we would like to give a big hand of applause to uh, the